Wallach on Law examines criminal cases and criminal justice and asks the question, we are tough on crime, but is that helping? Can we be smarter and make us safer? You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Ian Wallach is a criminal defense attorney and civil rights lawyer in Los Angeles and New York. Whose cases have ranged from defense of the accused to the prosecution of governments in their treatment of convicts. He's a former Los Angeles deputy public defender and a frequent contributor on legal issues to radio and television shows nationwide. You're out of order! You're out of order! The whole trial is out of order! You're gonna need a bigger post country. Our courts are the great levelers. In our courts, all men are created equal. This is Wallach on Law. Here's your host, Ian Wallach. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Welcome to this week's edition of Wallach on Law. I'm your host, Ian Wallach, and today we're going to be talking about uh, CIT programs, or crisis intervention training programs, as we continue our discussion about the problematic interaction between the police and the mentally ill. Now, the police, they're, they're, they're trained to detain those who are acting suspiciously and, and exert control over that person until they can understand what's going on. And the mentally ill, uh, just by nature, tend to act suspiciously, and they might not submit to control in the same fashion that the rest of us might, and that result can, can frequently and sadly be fatal. Uh, and then the victims just aren't those who get hurt, they're, they're, they're the, the officers as well, they're the, 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 the families, potentially even society in general. Now, Izell Ford, Dontre Hamilton, Carlos O'Connor, they died in the past few months, and, and this is what they had in common. They were uh, uh, among those, over 20% of those living in the U.S. who battle with mental illness. Uh, they were killed by police officers. Uh, the officers that killed them uh, weren't trained in, in how to identify or respond to the mentally ill. Uh, and when they were killed, they were, they were unarmed. And before they were killed, they weren't suspects in, in any crime at all. Essentially, they were killed because of the way that they thought, not any criminal thoughts that they might have been having or things that they were doing. And the cases of Azel Ford and Dontre Hamilton, those are freakishly similar. Uh, in each case, the police saw somebody acting strangely. That was the impetus. They didn't know the person was mentally ill. They tried to detain that person, figure out what was going on. The person didn't want to be detained. A fight ensued. In each case, the officers believed that that person might have access to that officer's own weapon. And in each case, officers shot them and killed them. It's tragic. It's common. Uh, it's really problematic. I mean, do, do we blame the officers? Do we blame the cities and the counties for failing to train the officers? Uh, or should we forget about the blame altogether and just try to fix it? Now, over the past week, I've had the chance to talk to people who are trying to fix it for a, ver a variety of reasons. And, and one way is through these CIT programs, or Crisis Intervention Team, or Crisis Intervention Training Programs, that, that help officers understand the needs of the mentally ill and identify them right off the bat. Uh, to understand these programs, I spoke with retired Major uh, Sam Cochran from the University of Memphis's Crisis Intervention Training Program, uh, and he sort of helped me understand it. And, he's, and I'm going to play that for you. I'm going to play that for you. And to understand why it's important, I spoke with the family of Dontre Hamilton. Uh, and Dontre Hamilton was killed in Red Arrow Park in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, after he had been sleeping there. Uh, when officers woke him, several officers woke him rep repeatedly uh, to try to understand why he was sleeping in a park. It, it's a mess. But look, maybe we can own up to this mess figure out why it's happening, and take some steps that might uh, help slow it down. Okay, to better understand what CIT training is, we're welcoming to the program retired Major Sam Cochran. He's the project coordinator of the CIT Center of the University of Memphis. Uh, he's a retired officer with the Memphis Police Department. He served uh, 30 years, and he now coordinates CIT programs uh, nationwide and consults internationally. Uh, he's a recipient of several awards, and even the, the, the one award by the National Alliance of the Mentally Ill, uh, NAMI, they've actually named their annual law enforcement advocacy award after uh, retired Major Cochran. So, uh, uh, Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate uh, you focusing attention on this very uh, important topic. C could you help our listeners know a little bit about exactly what CIT training is? Well, CIT, first of all, understanding of CIT, and it stands for Crisis Intervention Team, which has two concepts. It's considered to be a law enforcement first responder program, and it's also considered to be a 
free jail diversion program, meaning that the CIP program works very, very hard with other community resources not to put people unnecessarily in the jail. And I think that's a, um, that's a win-win for communities and for the officers and for people who struggle with COVID and mental illness. And I mean, definitely for, for the community as well, because I imagine the tax advantages are, are, are tremendous without the, the unnecessary incarceration. Uh, it, it, that and plus the fact that the CIP program is specifically designed to be a community program, not a law enforcement training program. You mentioned training, and training is very, very good. It's very, very important. But when we bring in those partnerships, we want the community to wrap themselves around the ownership of CIT. So I want law enforcement to say, that's our program. I want mental health providers in the community to say, CIT, that's our program. And I want the advocacy uh, to say, that's our program. And we're, what we're looking for in the training is 40 hours of training. We have these instructors that come in at different times of the year and train 40 hours of training to those officers that have been selected as CIT officers. These instructors are very diligent, very highly trained uh, professionals within the mental health field, and they present the training to the CIT officers at no cost because they're part of the community. That's that is place. exceptionally admirable. Now, if, if one was to be an officer and they were to attend a program that you were running or a program that you were design, uh, that you had designed, what type of classes might might they go through to sort of better understand how to recognize or respond to someone suffering from a mental illness? Well, we start off with uh, some very uh, fundamental didactical training of getting into uh, really understanding of mental illness, some of the diagnosis, some of the signs, and some of the symptoms. Uh, we go into uh, uh, some of the uh, more specialized areas, such as psychotropic medication, not to make the uh, officers pharmacists, but to have them have a better understanding of the difficulties of being in compliance and taking medication. Uh, we also have uh, officers to engage with people who struggle and cope with mental illness uh, in a uh, dialogue between the officers and, the, and people who have uh, a mental illness. And uh, this dialogue helps to educate both uh, the individual and the officers uh, into better understanding, I think, some of the uh, some of the real issues that are involved in crisis relating to mental illness, and that's a that's a win-win situation. Yeah, it seems like not only would that enhance, you know, uh, the, the the officer's capacity to perform his duties and do so safely, but it would also enhance the likelihood of officer safety and also increase, you know, compassion and awareness overall. And then there's the, uh, the the training that has to do with what we refer to as verbal de-escalation. Verbal de-escalation is a is really a course about opening up communications, maintaining those communications uh, to. Uh, de-escalate the crisis, uh, to uh, be able to engage with the person that's in crisis or those that are present at the crisis scene. The officer has a major role, and that role is to come away from that crisis uh, with safety. Uh, but in order to effectively bring safety into play, we need to open up a level of communication. So we have a lot of training hours that uh, takes things in steps of learning about how to de-escalate and learning the skills and learning strategies that are involved. It's fantastic, and I imagine that the, the primary benefit of, of the work that you're doing is that lives are ultimately saved. Uh, yeah, I think it, uh, it helps to bring about an awareness um, that the community is reaching out to address community issues uh, and to take ownership of that of safety. Uh, and that's what I, that's what everybody wants. Uh, we want uh, we want to be able to open up communications, and sometimes that's very very challenging. Uh, sometimes people are very very sick, uh, and it takes some really unique skills. It takes patience. It takes understanding. It takes all those attributes. Uh, but if the officer, with confidence, uh, can uh, oftentimes open up many good things by which uh, uh, to uh, work through some of the crisis and end safely uh, and peacefully. That's incredibly admirable work. Um, well, listen, thank you so much for, for your time. And again, our guest is Sam Cochran. He's a guest on Wallach on Law. He's a retired major and project coordinator of the CIT Center for the University of Memphis. If you want to find out more of his work, you can go to www.cit.memphis.edu. And, oh, Sam, you had mentioned an international uh, website as well? Yeah, it's uh, www.cit international.org. That's also, uh, we have uh, uh, over 2,800 CIP programs throughout the United States, 46 states. Many of them are, uh, um, are part uh, membership of the CIP International. 
Fantastic. Well, listen, thank you for your work that you're doing. It's, it's going to make a tremendous change. It's an area that needs tons of work, but at least people like you are out there uh, moving everything forward in the, in the right direction. So thank you not only for the work that you do, but also for taking the time to, to help us understand a little bit of it and, and to help increase awareness. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so the implementation of CIT training programs are one thing that can be done, uh, and all that seems to require is that we, own, that we own up to the problem, that we acknowledge that it's our responsibility, that we bring people together, and we give the police the tools that they need to differentiate between the mentally ill and, and the criminal and, and learn how to respond to the needs of those who battle with mental illness. And, and again, the victims here are, are not just those uh, individuals who battle mental illness uh, who die or are injured. The, the victims are the officers who face public scrutiny, uh, the loss of public trust. The, the victims are the taxpayers who pay civil judgments. Uh, the victims is society who really failed to protect w one sector of its own that's in tremendous need. But, but really no one is hurt more uh, than the families. To try to understand how a family can process and to try to learn what Dontre was like so we can maybe figure out why these things are happening and stop things like this from happening. We're going to be able to speak with his family, and we have with us today his brothers, uh, Nathaniel Hamilton, uh, Nate Hamilton he goes by also, and, and his brother Damian Perkins. Uh, Nate, Damian, um, thank you for being here. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Um, to begin, let our listeners know a little. What can you let me know about what, what Dontre was like? From growing up, like, me and Dontre was like two peas in the pod. Where I went, he went. Um, and growing up, we just always had a, a close relationship. And he was more like, you know, Nate, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, he, he was a kind, kind person. Why was he sleeping in the park? Because um, I would say, you know, he was tired. I know uh, from talking to him two days previous, he was um, he didn't have a vehicle, so he had walked um, maybe over 30, 40 blocks um, to a hotel room because um, his electricity at, at his apartment was, was giving him problems, and he didn't have TV there. So he said, hey, I'm going to go get me a room at the um, Hampton Inn downtown Milwaukee. So he ended up, you know, walking all the way downtown. Um, I'm not sure if he, you know, slept good or not, but he liked to he liked to go to the park. He, uh, I call him and he'd say, "I'm just in the park, relaxing, um, getting some air." Um, but I think that's just something he did to clear his mind. Now this case has taken on a, 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 a fair amount of attention uh, because people people learned that that your brother uh, suffered. Uh, from from a mental illness, what can you tell us about 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 how it affected how it affected him and, and how it affected the way he interacted with other people? Um, far as his uh, mental health issue, um, he would call, you know, me, my mom, and he would say, Are "You guys all right?" You know, I'm just calling to check on you guys, uh, and it was more, you know, he would hear a voice that would might tell him that something's happening to his family, that we're we're being hurt. Um, so he was, it, it was more of a concern, um, and it was overwhelming to him because he, he really believed um, in his head at times that someone was trying to do something to us, maybe if they were trying to attack us or, or kill us. So it was always a concern for his family. And it was, I'll give you an example. Um, we were working at a lady's house um, doing a roof, and um, Brown Trey said, do you hear that? And I said, hear what? And he said, man, I think some, you know, I'm, you know, I think that lady's, um, her husband might be beating on her. And I said, no. He said, well, you want, you want to go check on her just to make sure? And I said, no. You know, I told him no. I said, she, I said, she's fine. Um, I said, you, you know, I don't know what it was that made him um, go through those things, but it was always a concern to go check it out. Let's go make sure she's okay. Or let me let's call mom and make sure she all right. Or call the friends to make sure they're all right. So okay. it was always a concern. It wasn't let's go shoot, let's go hurt. Uh, it was always let's just go check on them to make sure they're all right. Damien, how did you learn about what happened? Well, um, I was uh, I had been at work all day and never got the news that a man had uh, 
was was killed in the park. Uh, I actually left work and headed in the direction where my brother stayed because that's where he would normally come over to Nate house. And uh, but I did I never got a phone call. He didn't answer his phone. My mom hadn't answered her phone at the time, and Nate he was working. We didn't find, to be honest with you, I was walking in my house at 12 o'clock a.m. And as soon as I walked through the door, my mom called my phone and she, she, was, she was panicking. She was, uh, you know, in an, in an emotional state and she was like, I needed to get to her house. So I immediately got back in my vehicle and uh, came over to her house and she was calling me like the detectives want to talk to me or whatever. So when I got there, I actually thought that my mom was Dantra in the back of the squad. But, uh, but the, the detective came right out as soon as I got out the car and he approached me and asked me my name. And, uh, and I, I, I asked what was going on, why is my brother in the back of the car? And he said that it wasn't my brother, it was my mom. He said, is Nathaniel Hamilton and Dontre Hamilton my brothers? And I said, yes, they are. And I said, what's going on with my brothers? Where are they? And he said, we need to speak to your mom and then we'll talk to you. And I, I said, no, nah, you know, my mom don't have to be in that car bar. I said, why you can't speak to us together? And he said, can you just please allow us the time to speak to her and we'll let you know exactly what's going on. So I waited outside for a second, but it was kind of cool outside. I hopped back in my vehicle and I was trying to call my brother, trying to call my dad, because I, you know, you left with shock, you know, and I didn't know what was going on at the time. So. Um, after I talked to uh, a friend of ours, I just waited until I heard a loud noise, and it was my mother screaming. So I got out the car and I ran over to the detective and I asked, I'm, you know, I'm, I asked, like, just tell me my brother isn't dead. And he he, he didn't say he he couldn't he couldn't say nothing. So I ran by my mom and you know, to comfort her at that, at that time, you know, and um, after, after that, they asked us to identify, well, they asked me to identify him, and they told us that Dontrea got in a, uh, a situation with the police, where he was, they get, he got into a scuffle with the police, and that resulted in him dying. Did they tell you if they were going to keep in contact with you? Did they did they tell you the extent that they if there was an investigation or what was going to happen to the officer or, or anything? At the moment, he did not t- say that it was an investigation. He just started asking us questions based on well, asking me questions based on Dontre's character. Uh, what 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 was he, what was he about? Was he angry? Did he have any issues or so on and so forth? And now, did they have any reason? I mean, did they say, look, he did this, he, like he acted a certain way, so we want to know this? Or did you think this was some form of like a fishing expedition to, to try to come up with a... Like, like maybe they weren't really doing an investigation for you, but maybe they were doing it for a fellow officer. Correct. Uh, basically, what they said was uh, the officer just began to ask like, what was he like the last couple of days? You know, how was his temperament? Uh, was he violent? You know, those sort of things. Did you um, did you provide the information to the police that he uh, uh, suffered from mental illness? Before I got there, they had already had my mom in the squad, so she 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 gave him the information okay. that he that he did have a mental illness. I I told him that. It was a con- it was controlled. Now the chief of police on the day of the killing uh, immediately re- released a statement. Uh, it referred to your brother as a suspect, and it talked about some injuries that the officer sustained. And how did that make you feel? For the chief, which is somebody that we we as a community look up to, to have him go on TV doing breaking news and say these awful things about my brother. It, it may, you know, we're all, we're already going through because of, we lost the loved one, but to hear these things that were said that were not true, we, uh, we were hurt. But out here in Los Angeles, uh, there was a man named Zell Ford. He was, he was, uh, shot by officers. Those officers' names were released within two weeks. How long has it, it's been, how long has it been now? Uh, and it'll be four months and two days. How would you like to see the public react 
when the tragedy when a tragedy like that which befell you happens uh, to others just as they're responding now come together as a community um, fight for justice um, don't be violent because we don't feel like violence is the answer to to uh, to the questions that that we have uh, and we feel like if we come out and we be violent it will be taken away from who Dontre was and who we know uh, what type of person he was he wasn't violent so we feel like as a family we shouldn't act out in violence your brother's mental illness was this used by the police to evoke sympathy on his behalf or disdain on his behalf and 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 why do people have disdain well i i believe when people hear mental illness they automatically think crazy different um and by putting that into the public's eye mental mental illness that gave the public a a reason to believe that maybe that Dontre got a little um beside himself and maybe it was a possibility that he could have did the things that the Milwaukee Police Department stated he did. Okay. Uh, Damien, I'd like to ask, ask you a few questions. What advice can, can you give to family members of, 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 of people who've lost loved ones at, at the hands of law enforcement officers for any reason? Me personally, I don't think the healing process stops. You know, uh, I don't... I don't think any any of my family members are getting any rest. But one thing that I can say to the families that are across the world and right here in Milwaukee that have lost a loved one to the hands of a police officer is don't give up. Keep fighting for your loved one because because your loved one is not here to speak for for himself. Don Trey speaks through us. There's certainly no words that I that, that I can that I can provide that are that are going to bring you any healing. Um, uh, I, I know that I know that people are so so sorry for your loss. Uh, I hope you get the answers that you're looking for. Are there any final words that that, that Nate uh, you, you want you want to share? It's it's a two way street, and we both need to learn how to go down and be respectful of each other's space, and and that's what it all boils down to: the um, police departments respecting the people and the people respecting the police department. Uh, right now, that's, that's what we want to fight for, respect. Well, that's pretty sound advice. Um, thank you both for your time. Uh, I, I hope that, uh, that the healing process is a, little, is a little easier on you. All right, we appreciate your, your time, Ian. I also had an opportunity to speak with Maria Hamilton, uh, the mother of, of Don Trey Hamilton, uh, and, and here she is. Maria Hamilton is with us today. Maria, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Maria, can you just tell us how you learned what happened? I was at home preparing for my next day of work, and I received a restricted phone call at 11.50 upon answering it. Uh, that was, so that was about eight, eight hours after, correct? Yes. At this time, I hadn't been informed or had I watched any of the, the news stations that after that evening. So I was unaware of anything happening uh, at Red Arrow Park. Uh, upon me saying my friend going to bed, I received a phone call from a restricted call. Uh, after answering it, I was informed that it was um, a Milwaukee investigator, and I told him I was alone and I um, needed to have someone to come and be with me. So I would give them a call back. At that time, I was informed that he couldn't give me a number to reach him back, but he insisted on me continuing the conversation, and I hung up. So I called Damien Perkins, my oldest son, and he responded and told me that he would be coming to my home. 20 minutes after I spoke with Damien, the detective called me back and told me that they were proceeding to come to my home address. At that point, I didn't know anything that was going on. I had a bad feeling, so that was why I wanted to have somebody with me before conversating with the uh, detective. Tell me through what happened when the police arrived. It was 12 o'clock. I had changed from sleeping clothes to street clothes. Went to a window and I seen the detectives pulling up. Uh, at that time, I called my son to see where he was and they came and knocked on the door and I went outside. 
by the time I got uh, around the side of my house to the front of the street, they asked me to get in a police car. At this time, I'm still not knowing what was going on. That I, They didn't tell me anything about nothing until I was put into the police car. Two of the officers got out of the car and approached my son's truck uh, to speak with him and wouldn't allow him to be seated in a car with me. About 20 minutes after asking me the names of my children, they asked me when were the last time I seen each one of my sons. Asked you what time you saw each one of your sons? Yes, starting with Nathaniel, then with Damien, which was standing behind the car. Thirdly, the officer sitting next to me put his head down, and I was like, this is about Dottre. What's wrong? Can you take me to my son? They asked me when was the last time I had talked with Dottre. I told them um, the day before. I had spoke with him several times, and it was pretty much it at that point. I started crying and asked them to take me to my son again, and they told me they wouldn't be able to do that. And I asked them if I had, if I was under arrest. They told me no, and at that point, they told me about the incident at Red Arrow Port. At, by that time, 40 minutes had passed by. So they kept you in a car. They got information out of you for 40 minutes before they told you what happened to your son. Yes. And then what did they say? Uh, we're sorry to inform you that this is about Dottre, and we'd like to show you pictures because he is he was involved in an altercation and was pronounced dead at the scene. I can't imagine that you're able to describe what you felt. No, <laughs> I can't. Pretty much went numb at that point. Did they provide you with any information about counseling or services or community or, 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 or church or, or anywhere that, that you could go to try to exper to try to, to try to handle or resolve or, or at least take care of yourself after learning this information? No. I was off I was not offered in any kind of services. Well, what do you do? Does it how does it affect you? How does it affect the way that you live? I am in counseling. Is it helping? Yes it is. And I think it's very good to talk about the hurt, the pain. I think it's a good way to channel your anger. Is there anything you wanna tell people who have loved ones in their lives who've been taken away from them because of any type of failure? First and foremost, I feel as though we should always make a point to tell your loved ones that you love them. I want to thank you uh, for your time. Thank uh, you. Parents aren't supposed to outlive their children. I am just very sorry that this happened. I am too, Anne. Thank you, Anne, for having me. And that's going to wrap up the show, but thank you out there also for listening and for talking about it. And if you want to do something, if you want to be proactive, you can find out what you can do at the website for the National Alliance of Mental Illness. That's www.nami.org. Uh, and you can find out more about CIT training at the websites we produced earlier or just, uh, or just Google CIT training. Uh, if you want to uh, send me your thoughts, please do so. Uh, send them to me at change at renovatejustice.com. And you can follow my blog uh, at renovatejustice.com or trialfiend.com. And if you need to contact me, you can contact me at the law offices of Ian Wallach or www.wallachlegal.com. Special thanks to my producers, Ryan McCormick and Mark Coleman in New York. But really, uh, thank you, thank you for listening and for talking. Because perhaps just by talking, we might actually stop people from dying. Uh, at least those people who, who did not need to. Let's let's get the dialogue happening. Until next week, folks, please. Let's keep using our heads. Let's uh, let's stop using our hate. Let's just keep talking. And tomorrow's gonna be a brighter day. There gonna be some changes tomorrow. Gonna be a brighter day. This time you can't believe me. No more crying in your lonely room. And no more empty nights. Cause tomorrow morning everything will turn out right Well, there's something that I've got to tell you Yes, I've got something on my mind
words come hard when you're lying in my arms or when I'm looking deep into your eyes. But there's truth and consolation. Now what I'm trying to say is that. 